Richard Butler. I'm going to give it a few more minutes. We're going to get started at 8.05. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, with U.S. Rowing's DEI webinar and today's at the uh, finishing out Pride Month with Pride uh, with an amazing panel. Uh, looking forward to hearing what does Pride mean to our panelists. You'll get to meet them. I'll get to meet them even more. And uh, hopefully you refer friends, loved ones, and even enemies to this webinar. So if you, this is a chance for panelists, three more minutes to go off mute, go off camera, do biological things, whatever you have to do, put tape around dogs' mouths. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Jess, coming in hot. Can you hear me, Jess? Hello, Jess? Where's the sign, Jess? <laughs> There's that. She, she hears us. You're on. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi. And I, I wanted to quickly say to you, Jess, hello, still haven't had a chance to actually meet you, but that CRCA call yesterday was pretty amazing. I agree. It was a really good call. Um, and I wrote down your number at the very end of it to, um, to call you. So I'll be reaching out very soon. And you know, it's really cool. Most of the CRCA team actually text me. Did they? Yes. With with there, feedback from it? Um, thinking, saying thank you. Yeah. Wondering why they never met me, which is interesting. Just, you know, just tying this all in. So. Right. Uh, it will, I think we will, I think I want you to introduce yourself on this call today. Okay, absolutely. Because you are carrying the DEI torch. Love that <laughs> background, Brian. Hey. I know it's reversed, but that, that's as best that I can do for right now. <laughs> it's it's only reversed on. We see it clear. Okay. You Let's see it reversed. We see it correct. Oh, you do. Okay. Yes. All right. Great. So for those in the audience today, uh, we have one more minute. We don't expect a large audience. You can use to Q and A box to ask real questions. Deb Arnberg from U.S. Rowing and Jess will be monitoring the Q&A. Um, if it's relevant to the present conversation, they'll shout it out to me or they'll say, take a look at it and we'll respond to it. If you want to banter back and forth in the chat, please do so on a direct message so that you don't pop up our screen the entire time. Sometimes we get side conversations within the chat. So if you need to say, I really agree with you, Richard, just agree with Richard, not the entire chat. Uh, but in the Q&A, uh, feel free to put that in. We will have the remaining 10 minutes of Q&A as well as uh, aha moments from our panelists as well as our audience. And we do know that the most of the audience will come later from the recording. Uh, so be on your best behavior uh, because we won't be editing panelists. No promises. No promises. <laughs> <laughs> fine. It, we're celebrating here. So, okay, fine. All right. So I would like to get started. I am Richard Butler. I am the co-chair for U.S. Rowing's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, Committee. I am really grateful to participate as the co-chair uh, into my second year, uh, along with Kirsten Feldman. Uh, we, this big ship called U.S. Rowing is like an aircraft carrier. And as you begin to turn it around, it's gonna take a while. 
And, and so we're, we're going to take a while of turning this idea of DEI with the US roaring around. We're going to be patient. At the same time, we're going to be impatient because there's low hanging fruit and, and there's, uh, the, there's the long game. Uh, I would like to begin with um, 29 years ago, 29 years ago, April 29th, 1993, I attended the March on Washington for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans was not voted into the conversation by the actual committees at that time. And so it was just the lesbian, gay, bisexual liberation march. And I was there and it was, Park Service blew it. Park Service said there's 300,000 people the rest of the world said there was 800,000 to a million. The Park Service actually stopped using the method because they screwed that one up so much back in 1993, their counting method. And so to be immersed in that crowd, what was most important to me to support that march is that all civil rights is human rights. And if I was not gonna be an ally of this movement, how can I expect to have allies in my own movement as a Black American? And so standing there um, amazed at the diversity of what the community was and is at that time uh, is, is why I'm here today. Um, I strongly believe in protecting all of the rights uh, of the LGBTQIA+, I especially focus on the plus because that my friends is the open door that we all are welcome into this community. And I strongly believe that and appreciate that. And so as we end the month of, um, of the progress, resiliency of, of the community, I'm looking forward to speaking to our fellow rowers, our, our, our rowers uh, who will uh, share with us who they are in this space. And you're gonna hear the word intersectionality a lot because in this conversation today, we're going to not look at the sexuality of individuals, but look at the multiple layers of individuals. And that's the intersectionality of what this is. And so I would like to welcome you all. Um, there will be awkward moments. Some of you on this call may be still trying to figure out, yes, Chance, there's <laughs> some of you uh, that are listening or are still trying to just figure it all out. You may be already be allies or you may be wanting to understand how to be an advocate. And we will have tips towards the end of how you can actually be an advocate of this amazing community. I want to thank U.S. Rowing for trusting me over and over and over again to have these webinars. And um, I don't speak for U.S. Rowing. I speak from the perspective of Richard Butler, the co-chair for the committee. And so keeping that clear. So I would like to open it up. Someone's trying to get in and they're coming in hot under my name. I love that. <laughs> Again, so I would like to allow three minutes or less for each panelist to just introduce yourself. And I'm going to go with how I see you on my um, a grid. And so Chance, you're on the left hand side of my grid and take it away. I note the relieved smiles of my uh, fellow panelists. Uh, my name's <laughs> <laughs> My name's Chance. Uh, I am a trans woman. I don't look much like one, um, but I am, which is pretty cool. It's taken me a little while to get to pretty cool on that one. Um, in the wrong world, I'm a coach. Uh, I was a moderately successful in a tiny program high school rower as a kid. Uh, wasn't particularly good. Got to college, discovered I was really not very good um, and stopped rowing for a long time, but found my way back to it through coaching. I coach at the high school level, 
Um, I also coach at the collegiate, the club collegiate level. I coach for a collegiate club team. And I also coach masters. I helped start a uh, rowing club here in my local community uh, that was designed around actually um, broadening the sport and bringing people from a community that is underserved into it. Um, we're not there yet. It's harder than I thought it would be to do, um, but we're getting there. Uh, I am in the Philadelphia area. Um, I'm old. Unlike mo I think I'm probably the oldest, might be the oldest person here. Uh, we love filters uh, and maybe a little bit of makeup. Um, but uh, so 70, a 70s child. And um, that's basically it for my introduction. I'll pass it on. Thank you, Chad. Uh, I'm sorry, but I always take ownership of being the oldest on the call. Uh, born in 1958. Thank you. I want to look like you. And no, and no filters. <laughs> All moisturizer, Richard. It's all moisturizer. All sun and at this time of year, sunscreen. <laughs> so, John. Yeah. Um, hey, everybody. My name is John Olbries. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I am a cis gay man who rose at Potomac Boat Club, where I'm also the club captain and have also worn the regatta chair hat. So, if you've ever raised head of the Potomac, um, that was my baby for a couple of years, two of which it never actually happened. So uh, it was a fun lesson in resiliency, especially uh, learning how to make regattas happen. Um, a little bit of background about me. I grew up in the D.C. area rowing for Wakefield High School um, and then went to the Coast Guard Academy where I rowed for four years um, under the the looming um, kind of blanket of the end years of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, which was its own mess in and of itself. Um, but I came out, interestingly enough, while I was there, um, and that was a slow, methodical, and very careful process, especially once I commissioned and went into the Coast Guard um, for real. Um, I stopped rowing for about two years until I got stationed in Baltimore, where I started rowing for what was then Baltimore Rowing Club and is now Baltimore Community Rowing, um, and really found the passion for the sport again and fell back in love with it and uh, started racing um, and came to realize through a friend of mine at Potomac after I'd moved to the club uh, that there was a a uh, really speedy gay singles rower out there named Robbie Vanson, who was doing incredible things with the sport and um, kind of lit a fire that had already been burning under my butt to try and make a uh, national team squad. Um, and, you know, I fought and fought and fought and fought and tried to make the team. And it wasn't until I was actually leaving the Coast Guard um, that a friend on a whim invited me to go do uh, new discipline known as beach sprints. Um, and we went to trials and we made the team. We went to Worlds, we got a bronze and uh, I came back and took a little bit of time off just to like kind of let all of the dust settle from a decade in the Coast Guard and being on this team um, and then picked up coaching at St. Albans. Um, where I did a uh, fairly part-time, like truly part-time coach position um, there. And I'm coaching the Potomac U19 team this summer. So I've kind of gone all over the place with the sport, um, but it's let me see a lot of things and meet a lot of really, really cool people in the community. Um, so I'm really excited to be here and be part of this conversation and to talk to all, uh, talk with, sorry, all of my amazing panelists who are also here. Thank you, John, and um, chance again to chance get a chance to say this to you as well. Uh, I appreciate you agreeing, both of you agreeing to be here. Kara. Right. Hi, everyone. My name is Kira O'Sullivan, and I am currently the assistant rowing coach at Smith College. It's a Division three program in Western Massachusetts at a historically women's college. So really neat spot, really cool, very queer space. So um, it's really awesome to get to be there now. I got into rowing in high school at Archbishop Carroll High School and absolutely fell in love with the sport. Um, started rowing at Temple University after that. Spent four years there, met 
my soon to be wife who I'm so excited to <laughs> spend my life with. Um, we're very dorky, we're very gay. Um, and then I spent a year after college training at Vesper Boat Club. So made my rounds through Philadelphia, um, finished training in beginning of 2020 as a pandemic and a back injury happened at the same time. So knew I'd fall in love with coaching and now I'm on year three of coaching and I absolutely adore getting to exist in this space and be a rowing coach and love this sport and watch other people fall in love with it. Um, I also am a co-host on the Gay Virgos podcast. Um, we just like to talk a lot. <laughs> um, Lizzie Houston is my co-host and we basically love using that space to highlight the queer rowing voices because there are many of us, obviously, including a couple of our panelists. John has been on the podcast. Chance, you're invited. Brian, don't worry. The invite's coming your way. Um, so it's a really fun community building way for us to connect with people who have had similar experiences to us and just create this awesome network of people in this sport that love it and get to be themselves while doing it. Kara, thank you so much for sharing your time and space with us. Feel free to put your podcast handle in the chat room and yeah. you're gonna get at least five new listeners. We, we joke that we only have like 10 people listening. Um, so including the people in this room, I think, I think we'll be up a little bit more. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so just for full disclosure, Brian was a last minute audible. We need another guest. And Brian stepped in, stepped out. And I don't know what to expect, but hey, Brian, welcome. Meaning we didn't get a chance to meet. That's all. Oh, well, that hurts, Richard, because uh, having hosted a GLRF booth at over 150 regattas from 2004 until today, I would have hoped that most of the panelists and you would have uh, seen our booth at Junior National Championships, at National Championships, at Masters, Regionals, at uh, Masters National Championships, Canadian Henley, at Head of the Hooch, at Head of the Charles, but I guess not. So uh, we, we probably saw the booth, but doing our things that we do, as you know, in our silos on those campuses. Absolutely. Nothing, so, nothing personal. So uh, I started rowing in high school and uh, rode for three years in uh, California in Lake Merritt and uh, then went off to University of Washington where I didn't row. Uh, my parents had a beginning influence on me that said you can't do fraternity and engineering and rowing. And, um, and then my mom also said, well, you won't be able to go skiing if you're doing rowing. And unfortunately, skiing was a bigger love for me at the time than rowing. So uh, skiing won out. And um, I returned to rowing after I left the Navy, after I uh, left uh, graduate school or finished graduate school and uh, started rowing uh, in San Diego and uh, returned to rowing in San Diego and then continued to row uh, in Newport Beach and then in Marina Del Rey. And I continue to row in Marina Del Rey. Uh, and I run the Gay and Lesbian Rowing Federation. It got its start in 2003. And the whole idea was to create a global online community for gay and lesbian rowers, recognizing that most uh, rowers row in straight clubs or community clubs. And this was a way to uh, give a shared uh, sense of community to people everywhere and connect them. Um, and it, it's, we've got 1,747 members right now. 
uh, in 43 countries. Uh, and there you go. That's that's where we are. So. And that's why I should have always known you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my reference was that we were able to get together really quick yesterday and meet each other. That's that's all. Uh, not anything personal against you. So appreciate you being in this space longer than a lot of us. Really cool. Uh, Jess, I think it's important that you're here on camera. You're new to U.S. rowing. Uh, let, let, let our audience know who you are and why you are here. Hello, thank you. Um, so my name is Jess Jackson and I am the new, very new diversity, equity and inclusion associate here at US Rowing. Um, I started about two weeks ago. So really in the thick of things, learning everything there is to learn, um, trying to solidify it in my brain wrinkles as best I can. Um, but just very excited to be one in the space with you all um, and two to share a community of rowing that is it's such a great community um, and it's surrounded by people um, who really care for the sport so that's insanely exciting and um, I think as the sport continues to grow and as people in this country continue to grow. Um, we're only going to create a greater community around one another. So I'm really excited to be a part of that community um, here with all of you all. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Jess, for being in this space with us. I am super excited that you are here because I am the original inclusion manager for U.S. Rowing and we were way ahead of our time. And it's taken uh, multiple years to now fill that slot. And I, I know that you're going to just blow it away and I'm looking forward to being a resource and standing beside you and let's, let's make this happen. Thank you. Big shoes to fill. Well, <laughs> Size 14 to be exact. Woo, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Wish me luck. <laughs> <laughs> and so let's just jump right in, panelists. Uh, we have 15 minutes for this one or less. And I, we're going to go around the squares. What does pride mean to you, our society, and in rowing? And you don't get 15 minutes each. We have 15 minutes total. And so I'm going to just say, who wants to go first? <laughs> All right, Mr. Coast Guard. Yeah, I'm, I'm always the one to, to volunteer first to avoid the awkward silences that always ensue, like, who's going to do it? Um, so pride to me is, it's complicated, right? Because um, it's not, it's not an easy thing and it's not, uh, it's not a simple answer, um, but for me, you know, it's it's finding pleasure and enjoyment and joy in general in in trying to to figure out the mess, you know, the mess of yourself and your identity, where you fit in into your own personal space, the mess of the world around us as we try to to understand not just just our, ourselves, but the people around us who are also trying to figure out themselves um, and the, the mess of the society in which we live that's grappling with uh, a lot of very difficult, really contentious questions um, and understanding that, you know, we know what we want and what we need to be safe and to be happy. Um, and that's not necessarily true for everybody. And that a lot of people feel passionately in some cases in the opposite direction from what you need. Um, so pride is also having a lot of patience and knowing that the answer isn't gonna happen tomorrow, but continuing to push the ball of progress, um, both for yourself and for everybody around you down the road um, so that you can make sure that, you know, the spaces in which you exist today are, 
safe, joyful ones for the people who follow in your footsteps tomorrow. Wow. So uh, that's going to be the opening for one of your keynote speeches when you <laughs> receive a U.S. Rowing Award in one of these categories. Thanks, John. Welcome. <laughs> Who would like to go next? It's tough to follow that up. Brian, go for it. Okay, well, um, I used to be a young gay, and um, for many of the young gays uh, back in the day, um, pride meant um, singing our gay national anthem, I am what I am. Um, but as I've shifted out of being a young gay, um, what I have found for me is important is a sense uh, it's it's all comes back to an interwoven uh, fabric of acceptance and inclusion and for those of you who perhaps are not uh, gay who are watching this the best way i can relate this to you is when i went to dodger pride night on june 3rd and it was just full of uh, LGBTQ uh, folk, but it was also full of straight folk. And those people were celebrating, uh, they were proud uh, to support us and they were proud to be with us. And so for me, uh, in a rowing club, what pride really means is that I'm surrounded by people who support uh, Pride Month, uh, but are also proud to have me as a member and proud to have me in the boat. Um, and that's, that's my take on it. Next is Kara. <laughs> and Brian, thank you. Brian, thank you for that share. Really appreciate it. I love the popcorn style. Um, yeah, I think I think pride to me is all about community. Um, similarly to Brian and saying that, you know, it's it's being able to show up in every space as your whole being, and being celebrated for every ounce of who you are, and not feeling like you have to pass a certain way or not be a certain part of who you are because of a lack of safety, a lack of acceptance, a lack of being able to be yourself. Um, so I think pride is the opportunity to say like, no, we're here. We've always been here. We are for sure not going anywhere. Um, I also feel like pride has a little bit of an edge of resistance to it. Um, I think for a lot of queer folk an existence is just a resistance and in a way and a society like John touched on that is very much so grappling with struggling with accepting that some people exist a little bit differently than other people. Um, and I think this month in particular feels very resistance heavy. Um, so I always, yeah, <laughs> um, it's, it's been a tough couple of weeks, that's for sure. It's been a tough year. Yeah. Um, so I think this past June has felt very like, okay, we are, we are all in this, we, we have each other and we are going to get through this because every other obstacle that's ever come our way, we've had each other and we've gotten through it. So uh, that's what this month was meant to me. And so chance to take it away. So yeah, I love, I love all of that. The, for me, pride is in many ways, I'm the youngest here, right? I said I was the oldest earlier, but in many ways I'm the youngest here. I've only been out for two years and that's to myself. Um, out publicly for a year and it's small. So for me, Pride Month has been about visibility, um, both seeing myself in queer spaces and what that means, but more importantly, as someone who's coached a number of trans male athletes um, and a number of non-binary athletes, I realized that I was not being genuine to them to not let them see that there's a space for rowing for all of us. And so my big draw to come out was that my athletes and the people who row in clubs with me 
need to know that there are people like me around. Trans, there have been trans people around for forever. Um, I know we're not all, you know, it is, it is definitely been a tough uh, year to be trans. Um, but it, for me, pride is about everything you guys have said, but it's about the visibility and standing up and being seen. It, um, because when, you know, I, I at least have the luxury of being old. I have the luxury of having a sense of self that's derived from action over the course of many years. Um, for someone who's 12, 13, 14, anywhere, who's unsure of who they are, the ability to see people like you guys, people who are here and are queer and are proud and are happy, to know that that exists past where, where they may be in their personal journey is so important. It's what helped me come out. Um, and I think we owe that to future generations. Kara and Chance, thank you for using this space to share who you are and, and your thoughts about pride. Jess, would you like to be participate or you wanna just be observing? I can participate for sure. Do it. Um, so, what does pride mean to me? I think for me, um, pride means being able to find your voice um, and being able to be a voice for others. I know when I was, I would call it in the process of coming out, but only my closest friends knew. Um, so when I was in the process of coming out, I think I was very quiet as many of us um, are. And these past three years almost, um, I've been able to start finding my voice um, and start finding you know, how I wanna express myself and what does that look like to me? And what does that dress like? And what does their hair look like? And all these new, fun, exciting things that I just get to explore. Um, and so I think with that pride means being authentically yourself. Um, and it may take some time to find, it may, you know, you may look at yourself in the mirror one day and be like, what am I wearing? Um, but just being able to walk out of that house that day and feel like, yes, like I know I look good and my authentic self. Um, and I think that right now in this moment is what pride means to me. That's beautiful. Thank you, Jess. Um, and I will throw my two cents into that. So pride for me is... In 1968, Dr. King was assassinated and I was 10 years old. And I stood in the middle of the streets of my community and watched our communities burn to the ground to, to say, uh, basically, we were told if we were nonviolent that everything would be okay. And they assassinated Dr. King. A year later, 1969 in June, we have Stonewall riots that created what pride is today. And that to me is what civil rights is all about. Taking the model of 1968, where I lost my 10 year old boyhood and became an activist to 1969, where I, I believe, and, and you can correct me, uh, that you told the police go to hell. The community told the police, nope, that's not happening and and the community around that and, and so we have to look at the intersectionality of the civil rights movement and stonewall and where we are today so that's what pride means to me that i have pride in when we're activists and when we're loud and when we're proud it may take a long ass time but change will happen so thank you all for participating in that. Uh, for the next couple of minutes, uh, we're, we're going to just, I'm going to talk to some individuals. So Chance, you're first up. 
So for, for everyone to feel included in a workplace or a school or a boathouse, we have to embrace both the commonalities and the differences amongst people. How does the practice and recognition of the inter intersectionality help a member of the LGBTQ plus community feel included? Sorry, I, just, I saw Bobby on this. Bobby just messaged and that, that made me very happy. Thank, I thanks, love Bobby. that, Bobby. Yes, thank you. Um, so even the full disclosure, I had the question in advance and I'm still not fully prepared for it. I'm going to be honest. So I spent a lot of years growing up as a cis white man um, or pretending to be one. Uh, I played the role really, really, really well. It's what I had to do. Um, there's a whole lot of detail in there. None of it, some of it pretty even, uh, but uh, not a lot of it that was fun. So for me, it's interesting to look at intersectionality because when I developed the language to understand who I am, I was forced to review intersectionality a whole different way. I've worked in education, so I was familiar with the term and I always looked at it from one perspective. Um, and it was very different to suddenly put on, to reveal who I was and realize that suddenly I was not you know, there are a few things, there are a few more diametrically opposed positions of power than a cis white man and a trans woman. Um, there, are some, there are some more challenging ones. I'm still white. Um, so I have a tremendous amount of privilege. And I, uh, the more that I have sought out community and made friends in my particular community of trans women, uh, the more I have discovered uh, how much the whiteness has affected me. Um, and so it comes back to the question of visibility and being visible and just being cognizant of who we're bringing to the table when we bring ourselves there. Um, so there's a lot of self-knowledge, but there has to be a tremendous amount of humility um, to remember to take yourself out of it and look at who you're talking to and see what they're I hate to use the term intersection to define intersectionality, but what their intersections are in terms of their lives. Um, and that works both with communities like ours um, and also with the cishet community with which we deal on a day-to-day -day basis because, and I apologize for using cishet like that. I, I don't love the term, but it's so descriptive. Um, remembering that there are intersectionalities within that community as well. Um, and trying to develop genuine relationships with people, which I think is the only way to get through to the next level of understanding we all need to do as a culture. Um, we have to do that. And I, it, so it's, it's complicated. And you see, I've already walked myself down a path and left some of the question behind and I apologize. Um, I'm hopeful the next answer, next person has a better answer. Um, but, but I think that's where I'll stop for the moment. But you know, come back to me, if, if I missed a piece of that, it hit me with it. No, no chance that that's actually pretty cool. Um, it is about storytelling and 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 really having that opportunity to feel safe to tell those stories. And all of your, you know, if I were to ask a question right now about define queer for me, you're all going to give me something different because we're all different. And, and that's really that's fine. And so we're going to get different responses, uh, even from the audience uh, who may not have thought about what you just said, Chance. And, and so thank you for that. So Kara, you have the same question. And I know you've been studying it for 24 hours. <laughs> not quite. Uh, <laughs> um, might have been like uh, 10 minutes before jumping on, but that's OK. <laughs> We're great, if not uh, adaptable. Um, yeah, I think going to build off of Chance's response, I think, you know, growing up, knowing, I, I grew up in a very different space as you, Chance. I, I grew up very much so knowing that I was not straight for a long time. And I think as a queer, younger human being, 
desperately trying to find little bits of like, okay, you wear your hair a certain way. Are you not straight? You are like this. Are you not straight? And I grew up in an Irish Catholic community. I went to 12 years of Catholic school. I didn't meet a lot of adults or anyone that was older than me that were very openly not straight um, or queer. And I think for a long time, I was just desperately searching for it. <laughs> and I think part of the intersectionality we, we can celebrate now is you're like, you're right, showing up in those spaces and just being visible. And Jess, I kind of laughed when you mentioned, um, like, do I, what do I wear? How do I look? Like, how do I dress? I feel that all the time. And I've known this about myself forever. And I, you know, I, I still look very straight, but <laughs> I don't think there's, there's like a, there is a gay wardrobe. We all know it, Carhartt, whatever. Um, I, I still look very straight a lot of the times and I can't just like run around and be like, this is my partner. She is a woman. Look, we are not straight, you know? So I think being able to show up and in spaces and just casually be able to say, yes, my partner and I, she, and she is like this and I am like this. And just being able to casually use those and not have people be like, wait, what? <laughs> um, that's the importance of it. And, and being able to have an athlete, a younger athlete look at us and be like, I can do this. Because I remember that feeling. I remember meeting my first queer coach and she showed up in corduroys and Birkenstocks before they were cool. And I was like, we are on the same team <laughs> um, before we even talked about it, right? Like she, it eventually came out that she had a female partner. And I just remember feeling so like, oh yes, I can do this. Like I can coach, I can be in the sport. I can be successful here. Just a huge amount of relief. And I did tell her, thank God after I graduated that she kind of created this path for me and she didn't even realize it. Um, so getting to do that and that's, I think I left also huge chunks of this question about, but that's how it's, that's what intersectionality means to me and why it's important, I think. Thank you for that. Here, I'll, I'll clarify a little bit. I, the la I, I referenced language. I knew I wasn't straight and I knew I wasn't cis, but I didn't know what those words were. For me, it's been about finding language in the last 10 years to figure out, I just knew I was wrong for lack of, and I don't know any other way to phrase that. That's 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 what I was, was wrong um, until I figured it out. But I, I get what you mean exactly. So I just couldn't find my tribe. I'm so glad you did. Great, thank you. Uh, Brian or John or Jess, that's fine, you're here. Well, John's next on the list according to the email. Oh, because I have a new question. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. John. Yes. Let's talk about representation. Let's do it. Um, Why so is I'm representation <laughs> important in our sport. Um, I'm going to actually start by talking about kickball and we're going to circle back because it's relevant right. and I think a funny story. Um, so the long and short of it is uh, my partner of four years, Dave, who is rowing adjacent, um, he is part of the Stonewall Kickball League in D.C., which is a big gay kickball league. Um, but he's on a team that is pretty straight. And by that, I mean like 40 percent straight people on the team, 60 percent um, not straight. And at the championship game, somebody was really upset and complaining that this team was allowed to play in the Stonewall League because there were so many straight people on it. And the, the captain of the team and Dave both said, well, what's the problem? And they said, well, they're just going to be better at us. And they said, wait, are you implying that the straights are better than the gays at sports? And they, the person who was mad said, well, no, but, uh, and there was like this kind of like, there was a weird implosion of thought that happened kind of right in front of them. Um, and the thing that stuck out to me the most is like, when I look at the sport of rowing and I look at the high performance spot, like the high performance level of the sport, which is where I've always really wanted to see myself, there aren't very many out gay men at that level. Um, and I think it's only until recently that we started to see a lot of out uh, gay women like Emma Twig, um, like Kenny Chase, you know, going to the Olympics and having the rainbow flag on her oar. Um, 
and Robbie Manson, who set the men's single world record time uh, that is yet to be beat. And, you know, that's, it's super cool, not just to show like, hey, we can be out here and we can do it, but it's not even a, we're doing it to be better or we're doing it to show that we can be equal. It's coming from a place of passion of the sport and just wanting to be the best at it and really wanting to, to feel like, the amount of effort that you put in will always yield dividends regardless of who you are. Um, and the more you work and the harder you work and the more you talk to people and really try and find your space within the space, um, the more success you'll hopefully find. And it's not easy and it's not necessarily always going to work because you know, kind of depends on where you are and what resources you have available and what coaches you have available. And if you're even getting the right coaching, um, but seeing those people who look like you at the higher levels of the sport, or even just in the sport, in any of the spaces that the sport takes up, be it, you know, in Philadelphia for IER this weekend, or, you know, in Sarasota at Nathan Benderson Park, um, like that is an affirmation that you do belong in this space, because there's at least one other person that's like you in that space. And so you know, it's, it's hopefully going to be safe. Um, and if it's not, that one person is the foundation for your community through which you can hopefully make things better. Um, especially if you have such a passion for the sport that you just want to exist in it and you want to like, you know, be that idiot who's waking up at 4.30 in the morning to get on the river to watch the sunrise um, when everybody else is still super cozy in their bed and that's all you're thinking about. Um, because it's a really magical place to be and it's a magical sport and having that feeling of camaraderie with your boat mates and your teammates is kind of what drives us, right? Um, so, so having queer representation in the sport is important because it's, it's just making it a safer, more fun place for everybody to be. And it gives people something to look forward to, not just for the sporting aspect of it and the adventure, but also for the community that comes with this like shared passion of ours. Thank you for that. You get some snaps there. Uh, I'm, I really like how you lit up when you talked about the people in reverence in the sport that represent that's important to you. And I, I appreciate just your body language you didn't see it i saw it, it you check out the video so so uh brian you have the same question why is representation important in the sport well i think i'm uh very biased because uh since i run the gay and lesbian rowing federation uh, we <laughs> have been trying to uh work on representation in front of people as a continuous reminder at all of these regattas. And uh, we have the banner at all these regattas at every uh, vendor booth. It says Gay and Lesbian Rowing Federation. And one of the first things it does is it, it has to keep uh, the idea of gay and lesbian people in the rowing community exists and uh, we're there. It's not we're queer. We're here. We're queer. Get used to it. But it's it's keeping the conversation going, keeping the awareness going. Um, so it's important for representation um, to have a recognition. And of course, anybody who hasn't joined the Gay and Lesbian Rowing Federation, we encourage you to do it because of the power of the numbers. Because where I'm going with this is that I've had the opportunity to travel and meet some of the higher level rowing um, people in the UK, in Canada, um, and in at FISA. And to be able to say, yeah, we have uh, 1,700 members in 43 countries, this recognition that appears on people, wow, uh, is really makes a, an impact. And if that number can keep growing, it just creates more and more of an impact. And it's not just me or our organization who can uh, recite the numbers. Anybody who's in the uh, gay rowing community can uh, say, yeah, 
we have um, this many uh, rowers or uh, members in this many countries, and you can always find it on the GLRF website. But beyond just the representation and the numbers, um, what I feel like is by having a uh, out representation, it starts to create respect. Oh, 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 oh,